What's up, guys? Just got done watching the new Avatar on Netflix, and I really loved it. I figured it would make for a good little video, even though we have some other things that we're working on, but everyone's probably watching this now, so I thought it would be cool to talk about some of the spiritual and occult aspects of Avatar, as there are some very deep topics and knowledge revealed throughout the show. This isn't just a Netflix show, it was in the original series, and we loved watching that show growing up, even rewatched it several times, including Korra. It's definitely one of my all time favorite shows, and I remembered when it first aired, I was so hooked and I couldn't wait for each weekend when new episodes would be released. It may very well be one of the best animated series of all time, and there has to be a reason for this. I think it's because it taps into our inner sense of the unknown and mysterious, and because the show implemented these spiritual concepts in such a kid-friendly way, it really appealed to a large audience. Of course, there were many things iconic about the show, from the voice actors to it being based on real martial arts, but there really wasn't anything else like it on Nickelodeon at the time. I honestly think Netflix did it justice. It's nothing like that M. Night Shyamalan movie which was horrible and tried to fit the entire first season into an hour and a half movie. The Netflix series is 8 episodes and each one is about an hour long, and I just think they did an amazing job. Sure, it's not the same as watching the original, it takes a second to get used to with the actors, but each episode is an hour long, the CGI is amazing, and even some of the writing is genius in how they mix different episodes together in order to save time. Not sure if that was the best decision, but I can understand why they would want to do that. I was also quite surprised that Netflix didn't ruin it with being woke or anything. I didn't get that vibe at all. It was honestly beautiful, it made me feel nostalgic and even emotional at some points. I actually would like to keep watching if they had more episodes. So with that said, I'm not going to break down everything, but just some of the interesting spiritual aspects of the show. There probably will be spoilers just in case you haven't seen it, so keep that in mind. The show is filled with deep occult knowledge, being based on Eastern spiritual Buddhist philosophies, we're brought into a world that's not too different from our own, which is what makes it so fascinating. The idea that this could potentially be a reflection of our own world. Aang, the last airbender, represents the avatar state, the chosen one, the savior that has come to bring balance to the world and essentially cause what could be considered a reset of the old world order. When the world becomes out of balance, it's the avatar's job to restore order. Now for those of you who haven't seen the show, probably older generation, it's basically a world which is deeply connected with the elemental spirits. So much so that there are benders, who are essentially trained martial artists who are born with the gift of being able to manipulate one of the four elements. So you have water benders, earth benders, fire benders, and air benders. By manipulating these elementals, which takes years of training and the ability to harmonize with these spiritual energies, they can then manipulate the physical world around them. Which is interesting, because I do believe this is possible in real life. I mean, think about it, we were just talking about the boxers who were supposedly impervious to bullets. There are people who are said to be able to manipulate chi to generate great power and even fire. But consider a time in reality when the boundaries between the spirit and physical plane were much thinner. It could very well have been possible to manipulate the elements in this manner. The Avatar is the mediator between these two realms, and he possesses the ability to manipulate all the elements because of this connection. Typically, for normal benders, what element you have power over depends on what nation you were born in. So perhaps it has to do with the location or race, but the Avatar is the only human that is capable of bending all four elements. This, and its connection to all his past lives, gives him the ability to have great power. Not only is the Avatar reincarnated in a cycle, he has access to all his past lives and can harness the Avatar state in which he has the power of all his past reincarnations. In the original show, it actually talks a lot about letting go of attachments that may be keeping the avatar from entering the avatar state. It even talks about chakras and how to open them, which is what Aang must do in order to have full control. They took this out of the Netflix one, but still, Aang goes into the avatar state when he's in great emotional pain or when he's close to dying and it's the only way to save his life. I find it very interesting because essentially, the show has these themes of destiny, 
but also that the spirit world has a great play in the events of the future. Almost as if Aang has no free will, but not quite. He can only control the outcomes based on his choices. But for example, in the first episode, the Fire Nation plans an attack against the Air Nomads as Sozin's Common is approaching the Earth. And why would there be a Sozin's Common in the first place, as only the Fire Nation and Water Nation really get advantages from what I know based on astrological events? It's a little bit of an unfair advantage, but when the Fire Nation comes to the Air Temple, they're trying to kill the Avatar so that they can take over the world. Fire being the dictator energy, the need to expand and destroy. Also, apparently the Fire Nation is growing hybrid creatures. Thought that was a weird reference to show, but yeah, there are a bunch of hybrids in this world. So Aang coincidentally leaves right before the Fire Nation shows up. Was it his choice to leave? Or was his destiny? As when he leaves, a storm approaches and he almost drowns, but the Avatar state saves him by freezing him for the next hundred years. It's almost as if the spirits designed this so that he would live to save the world in the future. If he would have stayed in the air temple, he would have been killed. The Netflix version did some interesting things where they added Yang Chen in the first episode, where it's revealed that Aang is the Avatar. And they also did this whole thing with Kyoshi where she takes over Aang, which doesn't happen until a future episode, but I actually really enjoyed it. I thought it was pretty cool. Aang is afraid to use his power, whereas the other avatars understand that sometimes you have to be a merciless warrior if you want to save the world. Aang struggles with this being an air nomad as he always would like to avoid conflict if possible and find a solution that does not involve violence. Episodes 3 and 4 involves Omashu, and I see what they did. They kind of put the Mechanist, Jet, Boomy, and Secret Tunnel all mashed up into these two episodes, but they did an okay job. I don't think they really had the budget to literally do every single episode, so they had to make shortcuts. And it was pretty clever writing to put it together in this way where it still stays true to the story. I'm just interested to see how they continue with the next seasons. Also, I don't really like how Aang doesn't have to go through any bending training at all throughout all 8 episodes. That's one of the things that made the show relatable is that you're watching Aang learn, but in the Netflix show it doesn't really talk about that. And it also seems to have made the decision to remove the love relationship between Katara and Aang. In the anime, they're closer in age, but in the Netflix one, Aang looks like he's 8 and Katara looks like she's 16 or 17. That's a big part of the original show, which is what not only contributes to Aang becoming the Avatar, but also is the challenge in him reaching his controlled Avatar state. But yeah, it was cool to see the badger moles and they even have the secret tunnel hippies. Oh, and how can I not mention the cabbages? Yeah, that was awesome that they included that. But did you know there are a few conspiracies about cabbages in the show? One talks about how the cabbage dealer is a member of the White Lotus. And also, in the bloodbending episode from the original series, there's a shot where one of the cabbages has a face as Katara's talking about her grand grand. Which that episode is probably one of the darkest episodes. But yeah, I thought that was crazy that even in Avatar, they have cabbage conspiracies. My cabbages! Okay, so this is when it gets interesting. I love episode 5, Spirited Away. This is where we learn more of the nature of this realm and how similar it is to our world. So they make their way to a village where the nearby forest had just been burned by the Fire Nation. One of the villagers believes that their land has become sick, and now weird things started occurring. They can't grow crops, and have resulted to search for food, but people are going missing. So Aang and the crew decide to help. Aang already has deep knowledge about the spirit world here, where in the show he actually has to go through the process of learning about it, but in the Netflix one, the air nomads must have taught him. So he's telling Katara that the world we live in isn't the only world there is. That there's another realm beyond ours. The spirit world. And even though these realms usually remain separate, there are places and times where the barrier between them is thin. And the forest is one of these places. Which is super interesting if you tie that back to Missing 411, which is a whole different topic. But I do find it interesting that forests are constantly referenced as places where you can more easily tap in with otherworldly spirits. Maybe explains many cryptid sightings. So they find this shrine to the spirit of the forest, and Aang starts meditating in order to astral project. 
So they're showing you this isn't just a fantasy. This is from Eastern occultism, the ability for one to leave their body and explore the spirit or astral realms. Interestingly, in this one, they actually all go to the spirit realm, which is different, but I see why they made the decision as they're combining future episodes into one, which isn't that bad of an idea. Meanwhile, we actually get to see June and Nyla, which is pretty sweet, lots of creatures in this episode. Okay, so the gang is all in the spirit world wandering around and they come across this owl. Which is funny, because before watching the Netflix show, I was thinking, like, oh, it would be so awesome if they did the library episode at some point, because I always loved the owl. But they for some reason decided to put it in the spirit world episode, which seems unnecessary, but I'm not complaining. This owl is the spirit of knowledge itself, and only the avatar can comprehend its speech. Sokka thinks it's just some birdie, and also tying back to that library episode, they also have the foxes here too, but I won't ruin that just yet on the significance of how that ties into later episodes. But that was good writing for sure. Not how it went, but very interesting. Well, the owl tells Aang that there are some very dangerous spirits here and that they need to be careful and that there are creatures that will eat your soul. Now, this is crazy as we'll see, but also, this episode is a mix of the fog episode too, which I find very synchronistic because essentially, Katara and Sokka have to face their traumas, truths that they were never prepared to face, and they combine this with Ko, the face stealer. So after following the path, they get attacked by the spirit of the forest, which is actually a good spirit, it's just really upset and hurt, but they get separated from this and basically end up in the fog. Katara and Sokka have to relive their most painful memories, so essentially they get lost in the fog. While this is happening, Aang wanders into a cave and we meet Ko, one if not the only real demon in the show. It's super creepy, even in the original, but what I find so fascinating, if you watched our last episode, well, Ko has the face of a clown, and he is the face stealer. Interestingly, in the Netflix version, the fog is the way to lure his victims so that he can eat them or steal their faces, their identities, their souls. That can't just be a coincidence that he is depicted as a clown face, and if that's not enough, it literally laughs like a clown. So another reference to an identity stealer, a Nephilim on the spirit realm that devours souls and steals their face while they're being lost by their own trauma. Aang escapes and makes it to a hut where he meets the spirit of his mentor, Gyatso. Interestingly, we see Uzumaki's hinting towards the cycle of life. And they even have a discussion where it's revealed that it was destiny that Aang was not there when the Fire Nation attacked, and that he must learn to let go so that he can fully move on. It's also hinting towards Gyatso not being able to move on either until he had met with Aang again. Or, he knows that this was a one-time experience and that he wouldn't see Aang in the spirit realm again. He chose not to move on to the next stage of enlightenment because of Aang, but after this experience, it would seem that he finally moves on. Well, Ko has captured Katara and Sokka as food, and now Aang needs to speak with another avatar in order to find out how to save them as he's not strong enough to fight this demon, clown, worm, scorpion, spider spirit. Apparently, only Roku knows how to best the spirit, so Aang heads to the Fire Nation to Roku's shrine. Coincidentally, the next episode is called Mask, and it ties in perfect with the last episode, which is really good writing on multiple levels. So Aang meets up with Roku, and we learn that although the Avatar reincarnates, each Avatar is a different person with a unique personality and ideals, each offering different advice. Aang wants to help with Ko, but Roku is obviously fearful of this primal spirit or demon, saying that he's extremely dangerous. Even Avatar Kurik lost his love's soul to the demon. But Aang must do whatever it takes, and thinks Roku found a way to defeat him, but that's not the case. Roku stole an artifact or totem from Ko, which is super interesting and not in the original show, but I thought it was a great addition. This totem is something that Ko needs and cannot forget. It is a pendant that belonged to the Mother of Faces, an ancient spirit who crafted faces for all living beings. It's because of her 
that identity came into this world. This ancient spirit of Aces is Ko's mother. Now the show says that Ko longs for family, but it's almost as if this demon longs for some type of identity because he doesn't have a face. He only has the clown mask. So because the demon cannot have an identity and start a family, instead it steals the souls and identities of others. Very similar to what would be the case with these disembodied Nephilim or DMT jesters. They're stuck on another realm and wish to know what it's like to be human, to have a soul. And so they attach themselves to souls who suffer from trauma. But in the process, they are devoured and lose their identity. Hence, the mask or loss of their face. Now there are a few real world examples of similar spirits. In Japanese folklore, the Noperabo or the faceless ghost, is a spirit with no face. It's not the same, but perhaps it may be connected as they were known primarily for frightening humans and would impersonate someone familiar to the victim before causing their features to disappear, leaving a blank, smooth sheet of skin where their face would be. Pretty sure I heard a story like this from Missing411, but there are stories of hikers running into people like this in the woods. It almost seems like a trickster spirit that tries to give the illusion of being someone who is familiar, but has no real identity. Then you have the Slua from Celtic folklore, that are these evil spirits that prey on the souls of those who are dying. They are feared for swooping down to capture souls before they can pass on, trapping them forever to fly within their dark flock. Interestingly, they combine this episode with the mask episode where Zuko saves Aang from the Fire Nation prison. Aang takes the totem back to Ko and gets his friends back, and as this is happening, Aro is saying something that connects with all this. We travel incredible distances, risk our lives, even fight monsters. That it's scary to admit that you may need people. Some may see that as a weakness. After all, what greater pain is there than losing someone you love? Or worse, finding out someone you love has left you behind. I guess that's why we feel the need to hide away and protect ourselves. So we put on a mask. It's not hard to understand why. What's hard is knowing that sometimes, the mask is who you really are. Thought that was deep, but those two were the best episodes, I feel like. Then the last two episodes involve the North Water Tribe. Which I won't break it down, but I did want to talk about the moon and ocean spirits. These are two powerful elemental spirits that reside in the spirit oasis at the North Pole. In the Netflix version, there's a single night when they decide to manifest as physical mortal beings, manifesting as a white and black koi fish. The moon spirit is also the first waterbender and the root of all waterbending. The waterbenders learned from the moon, watching the tides rise. Without the moon, waterbenders cannot bend water, and I always thought this part was super occult when Zhao kills the moon spirit and the moon disappears. Zhao finds this out through searching through ancient esoteric scrolls that the spirits had mortal incarnations and could be destroyed, resulting in an end to waterbending. I always liked that part about Avatar is that there are multiple instances where they find secret knowledge that not everyone knows about concerning the spirit realm. Then there's Princess Yue, so she's got the special connection to the moon spirit because part of its life force was given to her when she was born. Basically, she's alive because of it, and when Zhao messes everything up by taking out the moon spirit, Yue decides that it's her turn to give back, so she sacrifices herself to bring the moon spirit back to life. Which is wild because now she's the moon, or at least part of her is. It's this moment where you see just how deeply connected everything is how the spirits in the real world rely on each other. So the show is filled with occult themes, with one of the most prominent occult knowledge being the power of the elementals and the effect that they have on our own. This is a real world concept. In both Avatar The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra, the bending arts are rooted in the manipulation of the four classical elements, water, earth, fire, and air. This mirrors the concept of tattvas in Hinduism and Buddhism, where the elements, including ether or spirit, make up the fundamental aspects of our world. Ether, or spirit, is akin to the avatar state, a powerful manifestation of all the elements combined, representing balance and the connection to the spirit world, or the entire universe itself. 
The classical elements are the heart of ancient wisdom and esoteric knowledge, where earth, water, air, fire, and aether serve as the foundational pillars explaining the universe's intricate design. This quintet of elements has been a cornerstone in the philosophies of diverse cultures, stretching from the ancient Greeks, to the mystic landscapes of Tibet, to the rich spiritual wisdom of India. These traditions, though varied in language and expression, referring to air as wind, and the elusive fifth element as void or space, share a common pursuit to unravel the mysteries of existence through the primal forces that shape our world. The inclusion of aether or spirit into this elemental framework marks a significant evolution in the understanding of the material and immaterial universe. Aether is often seen as the bridge between the tangible and the ethereal, the substance connecting the physical to the spiritual, infusing the classical elements with the divine essence. Ancient philosophers and sages across these cultures delved into the properties and interconnections of the elements, weaving them into their observations of nature, their cosmological speculations, and their mythological narratives. These elements were personified, celebrated, and feared in the pantheons of gods and goddesses, embodying the powers of creation and destruction, of life and death. The philosophical discourse around the elements ranged from the concept of atomism, suggesting the existence of indivisible building blocks of matter, to the belief in the infinite divisibility of elements. This is the primal quest for understanding the fabric of reality. The elemental theory transcended mere philosophical musings in ancient times, evolving through the Middle Ages into a tool for empirical inquiry. Medieval scientists and alchemists, building on the foundational work of their ancient predecessors, embarked on experimental journeys classifying materials and probing the secrets of transformation and transmutation. This blend of esoteric wisdom with practical observation led the groundwork for the modern scientific method, yet the allure of the elements as gateways to deeper spiritual truths remained undiminished. The classical elements, including Aether, embody the ancient world's endeavor to decode the complexity of existence, offering a lens through which the interconnectedness of all matter, spirit, and the cosmos can be perceived. By focusing on these elements, we can do more than just find harmony and balance in our physical lives. It's also the gateway to creating a body of light, or an avatar, a vehicle for spirit world journeys. These elements are a part of us, and by learning to master them, we can identify where our lives are out of sync. We each have a sign we're born under, water, fire, air, or earth reflecting aspects of our personalities tied to our astrological charts. In many ways, we're all benders. It's just not as obvious as in the show where you see people literally tossing rocks or bending water. Instead, through our life's creation, we manipulate these elements with our thoughts, personality, and actions. By becoming more in tune with these elements, we're on the path to becoming better versions of ourselves. Hope you guys enjoyed that. And I'm excited to see the next two seasons. I thought they did a great job. I could break down more of the original show and Korra, but that's up to you guys. So let us know your thoughts and if there's anything else you thought about while watching the show. Thanks for watching, and all we can hope is that our minds may be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?